So Dragon's Dogma 2 just had a few more features being revealed after the PlayStation State of Play. We have some more details on the Warfarer class as well as some other things. First, let's go over that new vocation. It looks like we can only have three max vocations at once. This is indicated in the Warfarer logo and also in the gameplay trailer that we saw. So in the logo here, we have three different weapons. Also, the pictures that were given on the official Capcom website shows a different Arisen with three different weapons types so interesting to note there and of course this will be sort of a hybrid vocation among all the vocations so you'll be able to wield different hybrid vocations advanced vocations and basic vocations as well when you're actually in game it also appears like there will be an ordered rotation to the different types of vocations you can swap through so in the first example here we have the thief starting out with holy affinity which then switches to the sorcerer which then switches to the mystic spearhand and back to thief that is a full cycle of three vocations not overlapping one another. And in the next example, we have a magic archer swapping to a warrior, swapping to an archer, and then back to magic archer again, keeping the order of vocations. Now, I probably don't need to tell anybody that because of the nature of the vocation, that's probably going to be the vocation action, meaning that it will be the R1 button that you'll be pressing to swap between different vocations. And at this time, it doesn't appear like there's going to be any limitation on the different types of skills you can take with you for each of these different vocations. I think you'll be able to keep all four skill slots and it will swap along with the weapon that you have. Now that's all well and good, but the vocation does have a significant drawback. You will have lower base stats. Um, it doesn't really indicate whether or not this will affect stat growth. Uh, it appears to be affecting stats just outright. So if you were to swap from a warrior vocation where you had a high strength level into the warfarer vocation, you might see your stats change automatically depending on what different type of vocation you have. As of right now, there's no real indicator that the stat growth from Dragon's Dogma 1 is truly coming back. There also isn't really an indicator whether or not stat reallocation is going to be a thing, but given the wording of the vocation that the base stats of everything will be a lot lower, I would imagine this is a dynamic shift from when you swap vocations and not based on the stat growth when you level up. Which, by the way, wording it like that would also indicate that if you swap between different vocations like a sorcerer and a warrior, you might also see changes in your strength and your magic as well. So I might be overthinking this, but it does appear like the Warfarer vocation to description does give credence to the fact that you might be swapping different stats whenever you swap different vocations, but of course we won't know until the full release is out. And in that same vein, given that you do have lower base stats, which means lower damage, lower pretty much everything, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you focus on elemental weaknesses or knockdown power whenever you swap to different vocations. So that seems to be the best way to go. So say for example you're fighting a fire drake, you probably wouldn't want to attack it with anything related to fire, so you'll probably want to swap to a different vocation that has something like lightning or dark affinity. And likewise, if you encounter an opponent that's staggered, you might want to swap to the warrior vocation to then get that extra bit of knockdown power to then get some free hits on your knockdown opponent. And additionally, as I said, you probably won't have the vocation actions from any other vocation, given that your vocation is the warfarer, and the whole point is to swap between the different vocations. What all this knowledge tells me is that warfarer is definitely something that I'm going to be wanting to play on a new game plus file or my second playthrough. I'm definitely going to want to scout out any different bosses that I have on quests first just to make sure that I have the elemental weaknesses of each individual boss down before I decide to go in and swap up on my vocations with lower base stats that I otherwise maybe would not want to. And of course the other side of this is that you can perform some fashions dogma. It doesn't appear like there's any limitation as far as the armor you can wear so you could probably just wear whatever you want and then swap vocations into whatever you want as well. Case in point, Gandalf with a greatsword. Secondly, we got some more information on the vocation Meisters. These are going to be masters of their respective vocations where you can even unlock different vocations such as hybrid vocations, advanced vocations, and you'll also unlock Meisters teachings which are these hyper advanced moves that the Arisen can unlock to then equip to their desired vocation that the Meister is a Meister of. And immediately when I read this, I thought of all the different rings 
things that you can get from Bitter Black Isle from the Dark Arisen expansion in Dragon's Dogma 1, where you can unlock advanced skills for each different vocation corresponding to the ring that you unlock. It pretty much goes without saying that these will probably be the strongest skills in the entire game, the ones that you learn from different vocation meisters. Next we have the Dragon's Plague, and I've seen different theories about what this might be. Of course, officially it is a disease that spread among pawns within the rift, makes them more aggressive, makes them take bolder different types of moves and tactics, and eventually there's some folklore that it will turn them into a ferocious calamity if left untreated. Now obviously we saw this giant wart dragon that came in. I personally jumped the gun and made a comparison to the Ur dragon from Dragon's Dogma 1, but I no longer think that's the case. I think that this is entirely its own thing, and I was mainly referencing the way that it comes in from the sky in the form of a rift. So given the precedent that this dragon looks like it's definitely diseased with all these different cancerous growths around it, definitely makes me think of a sickness uh, that I think the Dragon's Plague might be referencing. So that could play a part later down the road. I don't really know if it's going to be a story related beat that a pawn in your party will then gain Dragon's Plague. It might just be a random event similar to how Pokerus is in the Pokemon franchise. But it's interesting to note and it does appear that this giant wart dragon does have its own cutscene as we can see in the trailer. So it could potentially be a story related beat that your pawn will be infected after a certain point in the story. Don't really know yet but hopefully we find out some more news soon. And lastly one thing I noticed about the Dragon's Plague is that it's giving me very Dark Arisen vibes. Like from Bitter Black Isle, how Damon is corrupting everything as well as the pawns that are there. I know that the pawns in game are technically ripoffs from different bandit types in Dragon's Dogma, but in the lore, it does appear like these might be related to how Damon is corrupting anything on his little plane of oblivion. Alright, our next piece of information comes from the IGN first final preview. During this discussion, Mitchell here remarks that there are actually no quest markers whenever you go on quests, and additionally quests will be given out as more of an organic request, as opposed to anything like a notice board or different icons that are hovering over anybody's head. Personally, I never was a fan of any of these quest markers that are over different NPCs, and I much prefer whenever NPCs are just there and I can talk to them myself, or if they approach me as what appears to be happening in Dragon's Dogma 2 gameplay right here. There's obvious comparisons to Elden Ring, but one game that a lot of you younger viewers might not be familiar with is Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, which is definitely a title that I go back to from time to time. In this particular title, there are zero quest markers, and basically all the info that you get about quests are either from NPCs or you can reference your little journal book with different descriptions of where to go and what to expect whenever you arrive at different locations depending on what NPCs tell you. It's very much a feel of having to go out and explore and find the different quests yourself and solve them yourself instead of being guided along the way like so many modern games like to do. And personally I'm all for that. Going into our next point with how fast travel is going to be handled I do think that it definitely definitely enhances the exploration aspect of Dragon's Dogma 2, and it really feels like you're going on an adventure of your own instead of more of a guided tour. And personally, while I can see how different people would be put off by this different style of gameplay, I definitely appreciate it myself. It definitely makes me a bit nostalgic for games before quest markers came out, and personally I just can't wait to see more. Additionally, of course, there's also the benefit that depending on what you decide to do in different quests, it will affect NPC affinity and can definitely cause some issues down the road or it might open some new doors. Uh, so definitely looking forward to that part. And as I mentioned before, traveling is going to be quite the arduous endeavor. Uh, there's hardly any fast travel in this game. There is ox carts that you can rent, but they're not safe. You could be ambushed along the way, or you could actually make it safely. It's just a give or take scenario. But travel is definitely described as a arduous endeavor, and it's definitely something you don't want to go into lightly. You want to make sure that you have your camping kit, which I've heard weighs quite a lot, and you want to make sure to manage your inventory quite well. Also, your loss gauge doesn't really replenish until you either rest at a campsite or at an inn along the way. And while there are different locations you can travel to along the way between major areas, it does still pose a risk because there are different dangerous monsters out there. The one that comes to mind the most is probably an ogre. But what Dragon's Dogma 2 is doing that I love, what modern games do a lot of the time, is that they're giving you a power fantasy, but it's not really given to you. It's something that you have to earn, which 
which is something, again, from games that are much older than the modern day. So I can definitely appreciate that aspect of it. Another comment that was made in this IGN preview is that port crystals are going to be set in large hubs, and the wording of how he mentioned this makes me think that port crystals might no longer be a thing you can actually take with you in your inventory, so something to think about. And while Mitchell here definitely hopes that there's a fast travel mechanic later on in the game that serves as a payoff for all the different long travels that you have in the beginning part of the game, I personally hope that this isn't the case because, you know, I like the exploration of Dragon's Dogma, even the first game, and if it's going to be as filled in and unique as what's being advertised in Dragon's Dogma 2, I'm just not going to get enough of it personally. And that's not to mention that, of course, as you play the game, you're going to experience different hubs, you're going to discover new things and different port crystals, but still, the invitation for long travels is definitely there, and I'm all for it. Another feature or lack of feature that we're getting in Dragon's Dogma 2 is the lack of multiple save files. It seems that we only have a single one. Definitely an interesting choice there. So it appears that as far as saving goes, we're taking a book from Elden Ring. One thing it does do is make sure that your choices and everything that you're doing in the game world is more of a permanent thing as opposed to something you can save scum. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, uh, save scumming is whenever you save before a major event and then reload your save if you don't get a result that you want. So it's putting a lot more weight on the different choices you're making in the game world, but at the same time it's also eliminating freedom and it's also making my life harder if I ever want to make any guides. So yeah, that's a thing. Thanks, Itsuno. <laughs> uh, different type of philosophy that we've been seeing in things like Dark Souls, but it seems like Itsuno definitely wants to follow suit. So it'll be interesting to see how the community receives that. And finally, everybody, those of you who are Fashion's Dogma fans, we are officially getting a photo mode. And while my expectations for this aren't really too high, I do hope that it's something as advanced as Cyberpunk 2077, because that thing had a really good photo mode and it's the new standard. And I really hope that Dragon's Dogma 2 follows suit. And no matter what, it's definitely gonna be better than whatever screenshot machine we have in Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. So that's what I got for you today. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments and I will see you guys in the next one. Have a good one.